Yes, a little bit about me. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. I have to say, David has pretty big shoes to fill. And this is the first time that I've done the sex and relationship healing uh, webcast. So I have to tell you that I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so forgive me if I say um a lot and stutter a little. I'm sure it will get easier as we go along. Um, I am from the UK, as you can tell. I'm actually sporting my British mug there, but I do live in Canada, in Calgary. I've been in Canada for about 11 years. Um, previously to that, I've traveled extensively and I've really had an opportunity to work uh, all over the world, actually, uh, in the addictions field. So I feel very lucky and very privileged um, to have had an opportunity to work with a number of uh, professionals and a number of people recovering and struggling with addiction. So one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about today, one of the things that comes up quite a bit for us, certainly around this time of year, is the challenges of summer and how people manage either in early recovery or being in recovery for a while when the summer comes around. Notoriously at this time of the year, people start to get a little um, nervous, a little bit anxious. Certainly for people struggling with sex addiction, you know, when the summer comes around, there's more flesh that is revealed. Uh, people are wearing a lot less clothing and that can be very difficult. We have the Calgary Stampede around this time of year, which is very stressful for people. Calgary shuts down for a whole week and there's just one big party. So, you know, the, the warmer weather, it draws parties, um, alcohol, drugs, and it can be really scary for people. So around this time of year, we really start to talk with clients and people and family members of clients about, you know, how do you cope this time of year? What plans do you have in place to safeguard recovery? Certainly, when big events come up, for example, I think you guys just had Memorial Day and you've got 4th of July and you've got some really big events too. How, you know, how does that happen? How does it work for you in terms of family, in terms of family parties? Is there an expectation that, you know, if you go to a family event, you ask your family not to have alcohol or drugs around? Do you... Uh, take your partner with you? Uh, do you not take your partner with you? Do you ask people to be very mindful and aware of your recovery? I think it's really important to have these conversations. Certainly if you're attending with family members, if you're attending with other people, I know that for partners of addicts it can be very stressful. Partners really panic when somebody goes to an event or even if somebody isn't, uh, whether they're there or not, I think it can be very stressful for people. So, you know, we really encourage people to start thinking about an exit plan. If you're going to a big event, um, do you have a plan for leaving? Do you have a plan if you suddenly feel very triggered or if somebody shows up that might be, you know, a stressful person for you? We encourage family members, we encourage addicts and partners to have a code, a code word. So for example, if I'm, you know, at an event and somebody shows up or I'm starting to feel very triggered, if I just say a specific word, my partner knows instantly that that means I need to leave. So there doesn't need to be a huge commotion. There doesn't need to be a big conversation. It can be discreet. And, you know, we both know what we're talking about. I think that's equally important for partners because sometimes partners feel maybe more stressed than the addict themselves in those kind of situations. And sometimes partners will overthink things, underthink things, see things, worry, stress, 
So it can be important for a partner to be able to say, I feel out of control, or I feel that right now in this situation, I need us to leave. Maybe, you know, it's important in early recovery, at least, to not show up to certain events or to recognize if something's going to be very triggering, to have an appropriate way of declining an event without feeling stressed or concerned or without feeling that you need to breach your own confidentiality or your family or partner confidentiality by having a reason why you can't come to a certain event. So we really encourage and we work with people and we work with couples and families to create um, a healthy alternative or a reason to be able to say this isn't appropriate for me. Maybe thinking about a certain time to arrive or to think about a certain time to leave. I know sometimes, um, you know, in my own experience, you go to an event and you may want to leave and your partner is having a really good time. And it can feel very stressful. You feel that you need to stay for them or maybe they feel that they need to stay for you. So we really encourage people to have a conversation beforehand to say, okay, so this is a time we're going to spend two hours there or, you know, the first um, something that happens where, you know, certain drinks come out or certain things happen is the time that we're going to leave. So you're not kind of making hints or suggesting or conversing or trying to get the person that you're with to leave and recognize what's going on. Equally, if you're a single person or you're going on your own, is there somebody in recovery that you can take with you? Is there somebody that can be your accountability partner that can see kind of like the blind window that can see maybe if you're struggling and you don't realize you're struggling or if you're starting to get triggered, but you're not recognizing that perhaps you're flirting or you're starting to get, uh, you know, loud or obnoxious or you know you're having fun but perhaps you're starting to cross some of your own boundaries somebody that can say to you in a way that doesn't create defense I think maybe it's time that you know we go home certainly recovery is supposed to be about fun recovery is supposed to be about us enjoying ourselves and being able to enjoy ourselves but it's also about recognizing that certainly in the beginning, there are some things that do work and some things that don't. And it's about really safeguarding yourself and safeguarding your recovery and being honest, I think, with whoever you go to an event with and being honest with yourself if you can, if and when you're struggling. Um, Sometimes a certain event may be a really easy thing. If you've had a rough week at work, it may be a really difficult thing. So I think it's about being able, where possible, to say, you know what, today I don't feel that I want to be in this situation, or today I feel absolutely great to go to this party, and I think I'll be able to stay longer than last time we went to a party. We also, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the three circles and, you know, I know that the three circles is something that we talk about specifically in sex addiction recovery, but I think it's very important in terms of addiction recovery in general. Our inner circle behavior is when, you know, my boundaries have failed when I engage in the following so my boundaries have failed if I pick up that drink or if I use that drug or if I act in a certain way. Our second circle, you know, that it, the middle circle is uh, my boundaries are at risk of failing when I engage in the following. Our outer circle is my boundaries are intact when I engage in the following. One of the things that I think for people around this time of year is that we will often sit in that second circle. So we're not drinking, we're not drugging, we're not sexually acting out, but we're putting ourselves in this slippery slope kind of risky behavior. We are 
going to bed late too many times or where hanging out with people that are risky for us or we're doing certain things that indicate to us that we're just kind of tipping our toes over the edge although we actually haven't stepped into the water and I find that that's where people will sit and, and will struggle for a while before ever ending up in a relapse situation. So I really encourage people around this time of year, or any time, but particularly to be very aware of that second circle and the kind of things that we acknowledge we do when we're just pushing the envelope. So that's a really important aspect. You know, it's sort of in line with that, if we find ourselves pushing the envelope or, you know, just balancing um, between the, the inner circle behaviors and the second circle, what is our fire drill or our planning? What are our red flags? Are there certain things that we can tell somebody that if you see me doing X, how can you step in in a way that's going to be helpful for me in a way that's you know of course i'll probably overreact because often i don't want to be called on that kind of stuff but if we can have a conversation outside of an event or outside of a stressful situation then you know there's a, a fire drill that at least allows me to get some help or to have somebody to say to me, okay, you're kind of skating on thin ice there, so maybe we need to just pull this in a little bit. And sort of equally, really being aware and refreshing our personal triggers. So what are our internal triggers and what are our external triggers? Um, you know, I was, I was taking a look at um, the Sex Addiction 101 book a little bit earlier and just really reminding myself of, of those kind of things. And I think the external triggers to some degree are a little easier for us to recognize. Driving down a certain road, traveling, being on my own. There are some things that are very clear to me that if I put myself in those situations, I am setting myself up and they're very triggering. Sometimes though the internal triggers like, you know, feeling shame or being overtired or allowing myself to get angry really can take me into that slippery slope without realizing it. So I think it's a really good opportunity to just remind ourselves, make a list of our internal, external triggers and be very cognizant of what do I need to be doing and how do I need to be checking in so that I'm staying sober, I'm in recovery, and, you know, I'm doing the very best that I can, you know, on any given moment. Checking with sponsors, going to meetings, coming to meetings like this, and just really being mindful and aware that, you know, it's okay to struggle and it's okay to be, to recognize that I might not feel able to do something. I might not feel able to go somewhere. I don't want to hang around a bunch of people drinking right now. It doesn't work for me. Being in a barbecue situation doesn't work for me. And I'm going to protect my recovery so I can keep myself safe. So, Really, I just wanted to open up the, the questions around some, some of those topics and really talk about how we handle our recovery at this difficult time. Thanks, Susie. Um, for everybody who tuned in late, um, Susie LeBrock is filling in for David this week. Um, Dr. Fawcett is in Seattle, I think. <laughs> Someplace that's not in his normal place to be. Um, if you want to ask questions, um, use the Q&A feature. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, and our topic is um, sort of the challenges of summer for particularly sex addicts, but I think addicts in general. Um, so many more ten temptations. Um, so while we wait on some questions, um, I did want to add a couple things um, that I do um, around 
holidays and summer, you know, I live in Palm Springs, so it's always summer. Um, sometimes it's more summer than others, but it's always summer. Um, so there's always people in bathing suits and pool parties and, and barbecues and, and um, you know, and then, you know, things like Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, when I have to go to an event, um, you know, I, I, I usually know by who's throwing the party, what kind of party it's going to be. Um, I'm single, so I always arrive in my own car and make sure I'm not boxed in so I can leave. Um, if I have somebody with me, um, Susie's suggestion about having an exit plan, you know, a safe word, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and our agreement, we always have a conversation before we go in the door. When one of us wants to leave, we leave. There's no arguing, there's no discussing, there's no saying, oh, but I'm having such a good, we leave. Um, and, and that's the way it is. And, um, you know, a lot of times people in early recovery will travel in packs like that, and you know, because they want to go out dancing or something. And um, they say, okay, as soon as somebody feels triggered or uncomfortable, you just say, say the word, and we all leave, and we all leave together, and nobody stays behind. Um, and that's how people stay sober. Um, as they make those plans. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of events, um, you know, pool parties around here can be clothing optional sometimes, and you don't find that out until you get there. Um, so I, I, I will call a friend in recovery and say, look, I'm going to a pool party, uh, you know, I, I will call you uh, when I leave, you know, just to make sure I'm still sober, and, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, we'll talk about, you know, this is one of those parties that may or may not be a party I shouldn't be at. And if it isn't, I'm going to leave. You know, we talk about it before mm -hmm. and then we talk about it after and, you know, process the feelings that came up and what I might want to do differently next time. Um, and it works. Um, accountability really works, especially, you know, when you know there's a chance you're going to be triggered. Um, and then the, the other one um, that I do, particularly during the holiday seasons, um, which is less so during the summer, although um, 4th of July in my, my house is a big deal. It's my mother's birthday and my parents' anniversary. So 4th of July was always stressful. Um, I have learned to do a halt, you know, H-A-L-D, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or anxious instead of angry. You know, I just say, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I anxious? Am I lonely? Am I tired? You know, I might need to talk to somebody. I might need a candy bar. I'm, you know, um, just to get myself back on track. Because um, if I'm any of those things, hungry, angry, angry, lonely, tired, I'm in my middle circle. Um, I'm in a slippery space. Um, if I'm bored, if, if I'm anxious, if I'm feeling ashamed, you know, all of those emotions that we don't want to feel, it's very slippery because that's, I mean, that's, that's why addicts, and we engage in our addictions because we don't want to feel uncomfortable. Um, so, so those are some, some tricks that I do. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Susan? Or? I, I just, you know, I, I think really just reinforcing that middle circle kind of stuff that, you know, if I'm hungry or angry or anxious or lonely or tired or you know some of the other things that we really underestimate I, I, I think in recovery often people will you know tell me once they've relapsed that it just happened you know it was just a one of those events and when you do an autopsy and you break it down you can really start to see where some of the behaviors and where we you know our behaviors go awry and it in, in my experience it's very typically some of that sort of that slippery slope sometimes you know i can i can do very well and and handle the kind of pool party that you're talking about if everything in my world is just right but you know let's face it it's not very often that everything in our world is just right so it can be those little things that can really trip us up so i think it's important to do that check-in with yourself and check in with somebody else before any kind of event i think comes up or any kind of stressful situation really um so that we are you know, honest with ourselves and, and recognize 
when it's stressful and I think arriving in your own car and there's nothing worse than going to an event and with somebody and they don't want to leave and you really want to go and you feel stuck and I, I've had that experience and it's just dreadful. It, it really is such a horrible experience. So it's about taking care of yourself, I think. Yeah, you know, and as addicts, we don't tend to pay attention to our feelings. Uh, the first thing we want to do when we have a feeling is not feel it. So we pick up the bottle or, or the drug or look at porn or do whatever we do to not feel. So we don't know. I mean, uh, my first couple of years of recovery, I didn't know what I was feeling most of the time. You know, and I, I had literally had to say, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I anxious? Am I lonely? Am I tired? I had a little emoji chart with the little faces with, you know, descriptions under it because I needed it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was feeling um, and what to do or, or what to do about it. So, yeah. Um, do you find, Susie, um, we've got some questions coming in now. Yeah, please do ask questions. I'll, I'll ask one here to get us started and we, we've got one in the queue. But do you find that um, during the summer, people want to come to therapy less and want to go to fewer meetings because there's more fun stuff to do? And do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? You know, that is a great question. Um, actually, yes, people typically during the summer come to group less, come to therapy less, you know, come to meetings less because there's always something else going on that's honestly more exciting or seemingly, you know, something that we don't want to miss. So we put recovery and we put our therapy and ourselves on hold so that we can be a part of everything else that's going on. And it, it really isn't a great idea. And often we really fight with people about the importance of maintaining stability and maintaining programming, therapy, groups, meetings, and all of the things um, that really allow us to live happy and healthy, that if we're not doing, um, we won't be able to attend, you know, a, a any kind of event, you know, because unfortunately, sometimes addiction will slide its way back in at that particular time. So it's very common actually around the summer that people tend to drop off. You know, it's interesting. I always, in early recovery, I thought, well, I can either have fun and do all this outer circle stuff that I'm supposed to be doing, or I can spend all my time in meetings. And it was, it was really black and white and either or for me. Mm -hmm. And somebody finally pointed out that, you know, you were spending six hours a day in your addiction. You know, surely you can just take one of those hours and go to a meeting and still have five hours for your outer circle and to do fun things. But, you know, my brain didn't work that way. Um, and if, some, you know, if I had a 20 minute fun event, it would keep me out of recovery for the whole day. Because I thought, well, I'm supposed to have fun today, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was just silly. And what I've learned, um, particularly like on vacations and things, is I'm much more likely to enjoy myself if I take an hour and go to a meeting, um, or, or you know, at least call somebody. Or you know, you know, I just my life is better when I do that, and I have more fun when I do that. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter if it's Memorial Day or July Fourth. I'll get to a meeting. Mm. You know, I just think before we go to the comment, um, we're not very good at balance. Um, so yes, absolutely, it's all or nothing. I'm doing 150,000 of this or 25,000 of that. I'm not going to find balance. And I remember somebody saying this to me many years ago, and it made so much sense that really it's about learning to fit life into recovery. It's not about trying to fit recovery into life. And I hear people tell me, I just don't have time to do this and I don't have time, you know, to, to fit that in. But, you know, we manage to find time to, I don't know, go on Facebook for a little bit or eat a meal or do something else. And we don't, 
we don't sacrifice certain things. And so if it becomes a part of life, it's much easier than if we're always trying to fit it in around everything else. Because then I think we become resentful and we start to feel that we're missing out on something. There are also some great ways to make recovery fun. Um, you know, make some friends in there, you know, socialize, go, go to coffee or dinner after the meeting. Um, and then, you know, see if somebody wants to see a movie over the weekend, you know, um, that, that's what has, I don't mind going to meetings now, particularly when I'm home, because that's where I see all my friends. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mind going to meetings when I'm traveling or on vacation because I meet people and they take, you know, say, Hey, let's go. We like this restaurant, come with us. And, you know, then I get to socialize with new people. And, um, Recover is kind of an ad adventure now, um, and I get to be present for the adventure. I had a lot of adventures when I was drinking and drugging, uh, but I don't remember them. <laughs> I don't. So, yeah. Um, so we have, um, well, this is more of a comment than a question. It says, my husband plays emotional hot potato. Um, the husband in question is a, an addict who's not very good about recovery. Um, so do you, is that something you encounter, um, Susie? Well, I'm, I'm curious. I, I apologize. I think you have to explain to me a little bit of what emotional hot potato is so that I g get it right. Yeah, if you want to you type that in and let us know what emotional hot potato is. I think it's probably, um, I don't know what it is, actually. Yeah, I, I want to clarify before I go off on one of my Canadian or British tangents that really doesn't <laughs> Yeah, you'll, you'll call our potato chips, <laughs> or french fries chips. They are chips. They're french fries. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I think um, while we're waiting um, for, for a definition of hot potato, which I love, I'm, I'm very curious. I, I think you're right. What a, lovely, what a lovely thought that we can actually make recovery an adventure. I think most of us and most people, most addicts, most partners, in fact, step into recovery in, in the initial and it feels like such a burden or such a challenge. And it's often not what we want because we really think that we're living our best selves when we're living in addiction and we're making good choices. And I really find that very often people see recovery as such a compromise until you know until life starts to get better and until life starts to make sense and it doesn't mean that recovery is going to be this magical fix it, it, there's still going to be crappy days and there's still going to be crappy experiences but they're not normally as crappy and so i think I think to be able to see it as something that, that can be so such an adventure and an event is a really nice way of framing. It's like going to the gym, isn't it? You can either see it as an adventure or you can see it as just this terrible experience. Yeah, I, I am. I mean, I guess I can really only speak to myself, but I thought that recovery was someplace I had to get to, you know, there was like an, an actual place called recovery. And um, but that's just not how it works. Um, and I learned to kind of enjoy the journey. I have no idea where I'm going. Um, and I don't try to plan all that much anymore. You know, I describe my recovery as a path through the woods and it's really twisty and I don't know where I'm going, but it's very pretty and lots of fun. And, and, um, you know, as long as I stay on the path, it's pretty easy. You know, if I start trying to hack my own way and get somewhere, um, it's, it's hard. Um, so, yeah, um, we have a definition of hot potato. <laughs> I tell him how his behavior makes me feel. Uh, the husband is the addict. Um, and he gaslights me, uh, blame shifts onto me, the emotions project onto me. I have to point out that his shame and guilt is for him to sit with and not for me to fix. So passing the, the hot potato from right. the to the partner. I think 
you know certainly my experience of partners is that's very common and a little bit as as we were saying before um addicts uh typically don't like to feel emotion and certainly don't like to be on the the hot spot if you like so you know very often we will find people particularly people that aren't in good recovery or if we're not doing very well with what's happening or how it's affecting other people um there is that blame shift and that pushing of responsibility and emotions onto somebody else because you know it's easier for you to be in pain than for me to be in pain so I think it's really important to be able to really acknowledge and, and recognize um, when an emotion doesn't belong to you as a partner particularly and be able to point you know to point that out in a way that's that's helpful um, or at least to point it out in a way that you then don't sit in that feeling and carry it because there's nothing worse for any of us as family members than carrying the guilt carrying the shame carrying you know blame and everything else because then that subsequently affects us feeling that we can't comment or mention behaviors moving forward and then we just end up um enabling you know the, the addict to continue in that kind of behavior so it's it's a challenge and it's difficult but it's really important for family members to have their own safeguard and protection and be able to not carry somebody else's guilt or shame or emotion yeah yeah, it's a, it's a good boundary to set to say, you know, this is your <laughs> problem that you're spewing at me. I'm going to let it be your problem. Um, Susie, can you um, maybe explain a little bit about what gaslighting is, just in case uh, some of the people aren't familiar with that term? Sure. So gaslighting is really when we are acting um, inappropriately, when we're acting out, when we are being irrational or bullying or illogical or um, unreasonable, but we project that onto somebody else. So I won't take responsibility for my crazy behavior. I will tell you that you're crazy and that's why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. It's really, really common. Uh, I think a lot more common actually than, you know, than people realize how often you know, we try and explain the insanity that we're feeling as partners or family members, or sometimes as therapists actually, um, or as friends in a situation and the person will, you know, tell us that it's our fault. The reason they are not coming home is because I'm so irrational, because I'm questioning whether they've been drinking or whether they've been acting out. Um, or, you know, um, they, they are connecting with other people on the internet because they feel so um, neglected by me, whereas, you know, I'm distancing myself because I don't trust them because they've been acting out. So it's, it's always about putting it back on somebody else and making it their fault. And, and eventually, um, a lot of the time, it will cause the, the victim of the gaslighting, the betrayed partner, to question, you know, his or her sense of reality. Am I really perceiving this wrong? Maybe I am crazy. Maybe he did tell me that he was going away for the weekend and yeah. I was too drowsy to hear it, you know. Um, and, yeah. And it, it gaslighting kind of starts slowly and builds. Um, it's, you know, it's somebody you love and trust and they tell you one little, I got to work late tonight, there's a big project. Well, you know, after, you, you know, a hundred lies like that, suddenly, you know, the big lie, no, that lipstick on my collar, that's ketchup. You know, in the face of all evidence to the contrary, you can swallow it. I mean, that's when you know when you've been gaslighted, when your sense of reality is just completely upended and you don't know what's real and what isn't. Right. Yeah, that's a great definition. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, 
Can you explain, um, and if you have any resources, give resources for therapeutic separation? Okay. That's a great question. So um, the, ther the therapeutic separation, um, really, I think um, a therapeutic separation is where uh, a couple and the therapist feel that um, the relationship isn't really working. Uh, in its current state, it isn't working. And there is agreement between all parties that there needs to be a separation. But the separation has really, really strict rules. So if you're going to separate, how long is it going to be for? Is it six months? Is it a year? What does contact look like? Is it email contact or is it phone contact? Um, what, um, where will, the, if there's kids, where will the children stay? Who's managing the money? How much money? Um, that there's to be um, sex or no sex or so everything is very detailed and very well managed um the if i can the question that that has been raised is there a way to initiate a therapeutic separation without a therapist i would say honestly no for the very simple reason that typically in relationships, we're not always the best at honoring our own or somebody else's boundaries. So although I see this a lot, couples will enter into a therapeutic separation and there's really strict rules and then they suddenly start to get on really well because of the strict rules, so they decide to have sex or they decide to go on a weekend trip and then everything blows up. So if you're in a therapeutic separation, the point of having a third party is that to remind you why you're doing the things that you're doing. And then while that's happening, each party where possible is engaging in group or therapy or some kind of support and then there is couples counseling to support the couple in, okay, what's going on in this separation? What do we both need? What do we need moving forward? Is it gonna work moving forward? One of the things that I have found with therapeutic separations is that it needs, they need to be managed very well to be effective. As soon as people start to cross the and each other's boundaries, it normally blows up into a really difficult situation. Yeah, they, you almost need a therapist as, you know, arbitration, you know, to, well, he did this and he's not supposed to do it. Oh, did you do that? Well, yeah, sorry. You know, um, you know, I had a sponsee who he and his wife tried a non-therapeutic therapeutic separation and about every two or three weeks, they'd be getting along well and they would have sex. And then they would have a huge fight and he would call me in tears. And, you know, uh, I had a sponsor who did this. <laughs> I just was like, okay, enough. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with, with Susie. Um, are there resources for, what kind of therapist should they look for for a therapeutic separation? Um, I think it would be important to find somebody that is trained and skilled in marriage and family therapy. Uh, somebody that has a really good understanding of what therapeutic separation looks like. So, I, I mean, there are resources I would think online, but I, you know, I would encourage, you know, anybody to ask somebody in their local area to find or to recommend a good family and marriage therapist, somebody that really does understand what, you know, what this kind of separation looks like. And what the purpose of it is. Yeah. I mean, the, the purpose is to clear, you know, clear some space and clear some headspace so you, you can both figure out what you really want or am I off base? 
Yes, absolutely. To clear some space, to clear headspace, to decide what is it that each of us need, because right now it's not working in the current situation. We're living in insanity and we can't make any kind of rational decision when we are under acute stress and hyper arousal and there's cortisol running through our brains all the time we're in fight or flight so we're not going to be making rational decisions we're angry we're sad we're all sorts of things and sometimes we just need some space so to create space physically as well as emotionally can be important for us, can be important for our children and families, so that it gives us time to bring our hyperarousal down and to start to feel safe and somewhat you know, calmer, if you like, so that we can really start to make decisions based on rational thinking and not anger or sadness. Um, we've got a, a, it's in the comments or in the chat feature, but um, one of the attendees said she's feeling muzzled. She's had three years of that. I, I'm pretty sure this is a betrayed partner as well. Um, can you address that? How, how um, when a betrayed partner feels muzzled, which I assume, you know, well, I'm not going to assume anything, but how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I would, I think, or would imagine that this feeling muzzled is being unable to say how they feel. Very often, betrayed partners, um, I, I feel like they're walking on a tightrope. So, you know, this situation has arisen. People have been victimized in their situations. Um, our victims are hurt and will feel like, you know, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So I wanna be able to say, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm experiencing, this is how I feel, but the addict, you know, uh, will tell them you can't, you know, you can't say that because I'm going to relapse. Or if you tell me that it stresses me out and I can't handle the stress, um, so people really find themselves sort of backed into a corner of being able to have a very open and honest conversation about how they're feeling in the situation and, you know, what's going on. Or if they try and highlight something, it's that gaslighting that it's back to, it's about you, it's about you, I'm not doing anything wrong. And that can be, you know, very suffocating for partners. Um, and a pattern I think that develops over time and you know one of the things that I think is interesting is that you know in our addictions it's all about us and then in our recoveries it's all about us and you know addicts are very self-centered and you know it's about well I have to go to these many meetings or I have to do this or when I'm using I have to blah 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 and I think often partners are like well yeah, what about me what about me you know when you're using what about me when you're sober what about me and it becomes this this perpetual feeling of of not being heard not mattering not counting not being you know a part of the equation yeah um one of the things about feeling muzzled um you know, if you if you those i think some of you probably attend dr rob's group on mondays or have read his books he talks about you know, relationships are built on emotional intimacy. They're not built on sex. They're not built on kids. They're not built on money. They're, a good relationship is built on emotional intimacy and honesty. And, you know, we have a, a tremendous need to be heard in our relationships. Um, I, I, I really feel for you um, feeling that. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a, a follow-up comment here. Um, she says she can say what she feels nicely, calmly, and then he turns all that against her and throws up the high anxiety flag, hot potato again, um, but from another person. Thus, where he cannot deal calmly by talking about negative emotions for three years. I can't be gaslighted anymore. He knows that. We're beyond that. He's coming out seeking integrity. So good. Glad to hear that. 
Um, for those of you who are wondering, Seeking Integrity offers treatment at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles. Um, that is led by Dr. Rob and Dr. David, and Suzy is also affiliated with that. So, yeah, we look forward to seeing him. Um, you you, you want to respond to that comment, Suzy? Really, I can just say that, you know, I, I, I really do feel for you. I think you are, in a, you know, in a difficult situation. You know, there's, there's no doubt that, you know, um, you know, people will find themselves in anxious situations or can be very triggered and feel extreme anxiety by, you know, I think all of us, when somebody will tell us that they're feeling a certain way, the guilt, the shame, the anxiety, and everything comes up. Part of treatment and part of recovery is learning how do I hear that messaging um, and how do I look at what I'm doing and take responsibility for my part and not take responsibility for what's not my part. But typically in, you know, in these relational situations when, you know, people feel like this, um, they will or he will, you know, just sort of throw everything back on you. And, you know, I think as a, as a partner, you end up feeling that you just can't take it anymore. And that's where it's really important, as Dr. Rob said, to start taking care of yourself. Because when we take care of ourselves, that's ultimately how we take care of the people that we love. We tolerate these kind of things because we want to be with somebody, we love them, we want to be a part of that relationship. And it's important to us. And we do it for you know all of the all of the right reasons. Um, although unfortunately, often in these situations, they're not always the most helpful. And those right reasons don't go away just because right. somebody's addicted. We still love them. We still care about them. We still want to be with them. Uh, usually, uh, you know, unless the relationship has completely gone sour. Um, but yeah. Um, and the questions here, um, I told my husband that I need emotional safety and re he responded by telling me that nobody is emotionally sex safe. You may as well ask for world peace. I realized that, that I am not enough to break through his denial. And I think what I would really want to say to that, um, to you, is no, you're not enough. None of us are enough. Um, the reality of this situation been, you know, worked in this field and, and been involved with addiction for so long is that none of us can love somebody enough to break through their denial. None of us can be brilliant enough therapists to simply break through somebody's denial. It takes a whole team of people to help somebody from addiction into recovery. You know, therapists and supports and families and and I, you know, I, I don't believe that it's true that we can't find emotional safety. We absolutely can. We can create and find emotional safety with our families, with our friends, with our spouses. Um, but that, I mean, that takes trust. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes honesty, integrity. And, you know, I, I think... Hearing that is probably, you know, where he's at right now. And that's more about him feeling that he's not emotionally safe, simply because of the kind of, I assume, things that he's doing. He has safety in his own world. And reality is that it would be very difficult for, for, for you to have emotional safety being in this situation. So I wouldn't expect that you would be able to. Um, I think that at some point we have to put our hands up as spouses and say, I can't do this anymore on my own. You can't do this anymore on your own. We need to do something different. And that's what I say to all family members that I work with. Yeah, and ultimately um, the choice to live a life of recovery is on the addict. Um, you know, I didn't get sober I came into recovery to uh, please other people, and I didn't get sober. 
somewhere along the way, I realized, you know, in, a, in the middle of a, yet another relapse, I realized I was miserable. I was dying inside. I couldn't live this way anymore. The next day I went to a meeting and I've been sober ever since. I did it for me. Um, you know, nobody was gonna, nobody could make that decision for me. No matter, and people loved me and want, would have gotten well for me if they could have, but they couldn't, I had to do it. So, um, Susie, I have a question for you, and this is completely unrelated to anything uh, we've talked about, but you have worked pretty much all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, does, does sex addiction look different from place to place? Um, are there cultural issues that feed in? Is there cultural shame that feeds in some places, but not others? Um, and are partners the same the world over, or do they differ from place to place? Wow. I wish you'd given me a heads up so I could have made some notes on that. <laughs> you know, um, yes, I, I, hmm, how can I, I've worked all over the world and I think that, I think addiction is the same the world over. And I think that sex addiction is the same the world over. I think um, culturally, there are some differences. Um, how men are treated, how women are treated, what relationships look like, levels of respect. I think that really, um, that varies depending on culture. But I think people struggle with the same fundamental, basic, um, inability to some degree to feel their emotion and to be able to have a, uh, an understanding of intimacy. I think, you know, I, I first trained in the UK and in the UK, it's quite a different model in terms of treatment. It's more harm reduction based. And interestingly enough, there's only two CSATs in the whole of, of England right now, which is kind of mind blowing to me. So, you know, there is, I think, a lack of understanding, probably more so in Europe than there is over here. But I think people's struggles and people's need to mood alter is, is the same, you know, across the spectrum. I think certainly certain cultures, um, lean towards certain types of behavior. So certainly in some European countries, for example, um, sex work and visiting sex workers is um, much higher, for example, than in other places. But then in the US, I think pornography is in Canada probably much greater simply because of access to the internet. Being in Western Samoa and Hawaii, I lived in the South Pacific and, you know, the way, the cultural way women are treated and, and men and some of the differences there, I think, make for some very different issues. And I would say in countries like that, partners certainly don't get the same kind of support. I think in some countries, partners are expected to simply tolerate um, because it's culturally seen as, as the norm. I think there's a huge, there's a long, long way for us to come, even in the time that I've been working in sex addiction from how we viewed it 10 years ago, how partners were viewed to now. And, um, and that's just in our own culture. And so and we are way ahead of, of many people. And, and, and yeah, even here in the States, the way we view partners just in the last year and a half has shifted pretty significantly. Um, yeah. You know, the codependency model is hopefully on its way out um, in terms of the shaming and blaming that it, that it throws at partners. Um, right. And I, I mean, even with, you know, drug addiction and alcoholism and, you know, um, the, you know, there are other places that I've worked where it's just such a normal part of life that people don't stand up and say, I'm an alcoholic, you know, you just, you just wouldn't do it. 
people are starting to stand up and say, I'm a sex addict now. A few years ago, that never happened. Or a partner would never say, I'm a partner of a sex addict, because as a partner, that somehow was a reflection on who we were. Perhaps who we were as, you know, as a spouse or a lover or somebody in an intimate relationship. So I think we are certainly encouraging people to stand up more and as partners and as addicts and seek the help that they need. And we're being kinder to each other and to people, which is really, really important. Cool. Thank you, Susie. Um, we are pretty well out of time here. So I want to thank Susie LeBrock for filling in for uh, Dr. Fawcett this week. Uh, David will be back next week. I hope that all of you will be back as well, and uh, we'll, we'll get Susie on here. Are we talking about getting you as a regular gig here? Yes, absolutely. I'll be doing a weekly group, I think, pretty soon. Cool. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll announce that uh, in our newsletter and, and on the website. So uh, thanks again, Susie. Anything you want to say to wrap us up? Um, really, I, I mean, I just want to thank everybody for asking questions, for, for you guys listening to me. Um, and for being honest and, and acknowledging that, you know, for partners and for addicts, this is a, a difficult struggle. And I think the bravery and stepping forward and starting to speak our truth is, is, is huge for each of us. All right. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next week. Log us out.